Good morning students, I'm Mr. Buscarini and for our unit on motion today's lesson will be about free fall. In today's lesson we're going to look at the following. We're going to explain what factors affect the acceleration of a falling object, differentiate that means tell the difference between free fall and falling with air resistance and finally see how to represent the motion of an object in free fall. And not surprisingly, today's lesson will start with an apple. Now every time uh, a physicist wants to talk about gravity, of course, he has to use an apple. And the reference, of course, is visible here. It's to Sir Isaac Newton and his observation in falling off apples and uh, the following formulation of the law of universal gravitation. Now, uh, first, the first question for us is why things fall? And we know that this happens because of the force of gravity, the pull of gravity from the Earth on an object. And we know that if we take any object, including an apple, if I let it go, this apple will fall down. But it will not only fall it will increase its speed as it goes down. And we know already that an increase in speed is an acceleration. So we have to start with these two facts. First of all, if I drop an object, this object will fall because of the force of gravity. And second, that as it falls down, this object will accelerate. But we also know that different objects will not fall at the same time. For instance, if I take an apple and a piece of paper and I let them go from the same height, I know already they will not fall together. The apple will fall faster. This is a common um, observation. And for this reason, this guy here, Aristotle, um, probably the most famous Greek philosopher, and at the time you could also say that he was a scientist. He came from 4th century BCE, and here you can see him depicted by Raffaello Sanzio. In, um, and if you want to see, this is a beautiful, beautiful uh, fresco, which is in the Vatican Museums in Rome. It has all the major Greek and Roman and other philosophers. It's called the School of Athens. So Aristotle said, according to him, a heavier object will always fall faster than a lighter one. And this makes sense, but we also know something else. We also know that, for instance, the fastest animal on Earth is the peregrine falcon. And the peregrine falcon can achieve a speed of more than 300 km per, per hour by diving. Now it's just going down uh, using the force of gravity. And if you will apply Aristotle's reasoning, will mean, okay, what if I take a larger animal? For instance, what if I take the blue whale, which is the largest animal on Earth, and just bring it on top of it, uh, up with an airplane and just drop it? According to Aristotle, the blue whale will go faster than the peregrine falcon. Now, apart from the technical difficulty of convincing a blue whale to get into an airplane, uh, and any possible ethical implication of dropping a blue wheel, especially if it's on uh, uh, an area which is full of houses, we know that this is not the case. The blue wheel, yes, will fall very, very fast, but not as fast as the peregrine falcon. So there must be something else. It's not just the weight that affects the acceleration which you fall under gravity. So we fast forward of almost 2,000 years, actually really 2,000 years, so from the 4th century BCE before our current era to the 17th century current era. And this gentleman here, Galileo Galilei from Pisa, made a lot of significant discoveries. He is considered the father of the scientific method. And one of the things he said that, according to him, um, two objects... Uh, even if they had a different mass, they would fall together, okay? And in order to prove his point, he allegedly went on top of a leaning tower of Pisa 
took two cannonballs of the same size, but one was heavier than the other, dropped them at the same time, and apparently they landed together. Now, first of all, almost for sure he didn't do this. Second, don't try this at home, don't go to the Tower of Pisa, because most probably you're going to kill one of the tourists under the tower. Now, all our problems uh, are born from the fact that we are ignoring uh, one of the forces that are acting on our object. So, when you have any object which is falling down under the force of gravity, gravity is not the only force acting on the object. There's also another force, and we met this force before. It's air resistance, that we, know, we can also call air drag or air friction. And air resistance, we can say, air resistance or any kind of friction always opposes uh, motion. And here you see this drawing of a peregrine falcon. We've seen it before. And what makes the peregrine falcon much faster than any other falling animal? It's because of the way he, he, he's able to shape its body. No? So what does he do? He minimizes air resistance. Gravity is the same, but he minimizes the resistance, so he can take more and more advantage of the pull of gravity, so he can reach really, really high speed. And you can actually try this by yourself. I mean, if you take the same piece of paper, you know, if I, if I drop it, it will just huh, fly around, and it will not go straight down, not, not, uh, almost like a feather. But if I take this same piece of paper and take a small ball out of it, okay, and drop it, it will fall much faster. So it's not really the weight that matters, is the shape. And why the shape? Because the shape affects the uh, air resistance. And this is what the peregrine falcon does. He, he changes his shape to minimum distance, which in some sense explains why uh, my old Fiat Panda will never be as fast as a Ferrari. Okay? It's the shape. It's all a matter of the shape. This shape has too much air resistance. Otherwise, I would be able to beat a Ferrari, right? So, what was the big idea of Galileo? The big idea of Galileo was, okay, let's imagine for a moment that uh, a falling object is not affected by air resistance. Let's take air resistance out of our picture. Let's just study the effect of gravity. And this is where we talk about free fall. And when we say free, in this case we mean free from air resistance. Free from the effect of uh, air drag. Now, if we take that thing away, uh, what Galileo said, and what then later was proved with experiments, is that all objects will fall with the same acceleration. So, uh, every object on Earth, you drop them, you take away the effect of their resistance, you see they all fall with the same acceleration. So, we can give a name to this acceleration, and we will call it acceleration of free fall, also known as the acceleration of gravity. And we will call this quantity g because at this point it is a constant and this constant will depend only on the strength of the gravitational force field on that planet on earth we have a g of 9.8 meters per second squared which for most cases we can round up to 10 meters per second squared. And if you're curious about the actual value, 9.80665 meters per second squared. So, at this point, back to the apple. I'm dropping an apple. I know that if I don't take into account the effect of uh, air resistance, this apple will fall with an acceleration equal to g equal to 9.8, or you prefer, of 10 meters per second squared. What does it mean from a point of view of a speed? Since this is a constant, a constant acceleration, sorry, we know already that the speed will increase uh, time. And this is our relationship. 
V, so speed, is equal to G times T, where T is the time in seconds. On Earth, we can just write 10 times T. Right? We round up 9.8 to 10. So it's very, very easy to study the motion of an object in free fall. You just count for how many seconds this object has been free falling and you multiply that number by 10 and you get the speed. So after one second will be 10 meters per second, 20 meters per second after two seconds and so on and so forth. But what about the distance travel? That is also very important for us. Now we want to know uh, when we drop an object second by second how many meters? What is the distance traveled by that object? And in order to do that, I mean, I could give you directly the formula, but I really want you to prove um, how we get to that formula. And for doing that, we go back to motion graph, more specifically to a speed time graph. Now, as we know already, the speed in free fall is always increasing. It's a constant acceleration. So in a speed time graph, from zero and going up. Now, we know already from our previous lesson that in order to get the distance traveled in a speed time graph, you have to look at the area under the graph. So the area under this line here. And we can already recognize the shape. This is a triangle. And we know what is the formula for the area triangle. It's one half base times height. But what are the base and the height in this case? Well, let's look at it. Now, the base is obviously enough. That's from the formula of the triangle. The base, the base is the time. And what is the height here? It's the speed. So, I'm rewriting d as one half times t times v. But, okay. What is V? If you remember what we've seen pre previously, the speed is given by the acceleration of gravity times the time. So it's one half times T times G times T. So what I can do, I can rearrange G as a constant. So we put the constant in front of a variable. T times T makes T squared. And here we have our final formula. The distance fallen in free fall is one half times g times t squared and you have to remember that g on earth can be rounded up by 10 to 10 so what is one half of 10 is 5 so the distance traveled can be just um, approximated by 5 times t squared in class we're going to do a few exercises on free fall but that's all for today Goodbye from Mr. Boscarini.